well, view of this and other things like that. But <coughs> so what we are saying is that if you, uh, similar to how you may study moduli spaces of principal G bundles on a three manifold, they possibly with boundary, you can take one of these rings of S integers, take some PL degree group, and study a moduli space of continuous representations of the fundamental group of this arithmetic three plus one. Um, now, the notion of space, to make this rigorous, you need to set up in various ways, of course. So, one way of doing it, which I think is quite reasonable, is, I thought, I'm not sure who first did this, but there's a paper of Chenevier where he sets it up, you know, a version of this uh, very carefully as a periodic analytic space, and that's a reasonable foundation. There might be other approaches as well. But, of course, what we're saying is that this kind of moduli space is quite similar to this kind of moduli space. And this uh, is very, very interesting because, of course, an arithmetic threefold, even if we like these analogies, is quite different from a topological three manifold. But there are many ways in which, if you look at these moduli spaces, they're actually much more similar. Because this pi one, this is not actually finally generated, but it behaves, well, we don't know it to be finally generated, but for all practical purposes, it behaves like it's finally generated. So this moduli space is very much like the moduli space of representations of simply a topologically finitely generated group. And in that sense, the structure of these are actually much more similar. So if you just look at the spaces from the point of view of these moduli spaces, <coughs> many of the distinctions disappear other than the fact that the fundamental group in the arithmetic case is more complicated. And um, yeah. yeah, and then you have to look at non-Archimedean geometry rather than Archimedean. Now, uh, so I, I just wanted to insert a few remarks that, of course, the local version of this analogy has been very important in number theory for the last 25 years. This is a study of deformation spaces that go into all these modularity lifting theorems. And so the deformation theory of Galois representations was, of course, inspired by people studying representation varieties of fundamental groups. A few other remarks is that one class of global moduli spaces of principal bundles and arithmetic theme that has been studied at least somewhat carefully is principal bundles for pro unipotent algebraic fundamental group of varieties. So these kinds of non abelian cohomology varieties have been applied to Diophantine geometry over the last several years. But for the moment, for today, so all of these are somehow similar and probably should be studied at once. We're going to study mostly, discuss mostly this kind of moduli space. So this is H1 with constant coefficients. Here, this is actually a varying coefficient. This is a constant coefficient, so that's just a moduli space of representations. Right. Okay. Now, but pursuing this, so what we I refer to as the more fundamental analogy between moduli spaces of bundles on three manifolds and on the arithmetic topological level or arithmetic three manifold, the thing to point out, to take note of, is that in fact, in topology, these kind of moduli spaces of principal bundles also carry global functions. What do I mean by global? I mean versus local ones. Uh, local ones are things like holonomy functions around knots that are somehow localized around a single knot. But they also carry all kinds of uh, global functions. And physicists have studied them for uh, many different reasons for uh, many decades at this point. And of course, <coughs> for number theorists as well, there are global functions on moduli spaces that we try to understand. Yeah. And the old one that's very, very hard is to try to understand L functions on these moduli spaces of representations. But the easy one is transignment function. So we've looked at one version of that already, and I'll try to just describe that in greater detail in a few minutes. But first, <coughs> maybe I'll give a lightning review of L functions because I guess there are some people more who are topological or uh, uh, more in physics in the audience. So this is a very superficial remark. These are superficial remarks on L functions, and Mark H will say more, give a much more expert survey is like to it. Uh, so what are L functions? So I'll remind you that L functions are simply topological invariants of an arithmetic scheme and a locally constant shape of A module. 
this can be generalized, of course, but in the first instance, this is the only thing I'll be concentrated on. So you have, where A is a subring of C or of QP bar, and you have a local transfer field from the merit predict T, and L functions that are topological invariants of that. And they're essentially completely rigid de rigidly defined by a few properties. By the way, this is not quite what you call normally call L functions. This is like one where you leave out all ramified parts, so it's sort of like a compact support L functions that I'm discussing, what Tato calls the zeta element. But anyway, what, what kind of an invariant is it? It takes a pair X and F and associates to it an element in the dual of the determinant of compact support cohomology of F on X. So this is one way of viewing the L function. Now, the, uh, this, the, so this is what uh, an L function is. It assigns to a pair of an arithmetic scheme and a sheet an element inside this determinant line. So this is subject to a number of conditions. <coughs> well, there's a, a, a multiplicativity condition that if you have an exact sequence of sheets, then uh, you get on the isomorphism of determinant of cohomology, the middle thing to the tensor product of determinant of either side. And then that should this canonical isomorphism should take the L invariant here to the L product of the L invariant on the, on the two sides. So that's the multiplicativity. <coughs> so this has lots of consequences, of course. So for example, if you have a triple of a scheme, an open subscheme, and a closed subscheme, a triple like this, then by looking at the exact sequence of sheets like this, what you get is <coughs> a, product, a, a multiplicativity of uh, L functions of L. Uh, so of x as a product of the one on u and the product of the one on z. I, I realize suddenly, as I said, that I already have to generalize from locally constant shapes. I should have been more careful stating this. But anyways, you can fill in the generalizations that have been necessary. First, in general, you need, you need to, to define it at least for perverse shapes. Anyways, if you, did, if you look at this equality for an increasing union of points, you see that at least formally, the L function of any sheaf has, a pro has to be a product of the L invariant associated to all the closed points. In a formal consequence of multiplicativity. Then there's a normalization for finite fields. So if, if X is a spec of a finite field, then you compute its cohomology. Well, it's just a module with Frobenius section. So you compute its cohomology using this complex, 1 minus Frobenius, whose kernel is H0, whose co kernel is H1. So then the determinant of cohomology of these two sides will be isomorphic to the determinant of, well, this complex in the middle, simply. So that's a determinant F dual tensor determinant F. But this thing here has an identity element in it that gives you a natural element inside this determinant cohomology of F. So the normalization is that over finite fields, this should be the L invariant of a sheaf. So this is the only natural way to get the L invariant of a sheaf over a finite field. Uh, uh, we should also remark that in the case that F is an acyclic sheaf, so if a H0 and H1 are trivial to this, which will happen, for example, if you twist it by characters up enough, then the determinant of cohomology has another canonical trivialization because everything is zero. And if you do that, the previously discussed element becomes exactly identified with one of these kind of usual determinants that we often see as factors in L functions. So in fact, if you put this all together, you see that uh, this expression for the L, L invariant of, of a scheme with a sheaf as being a product of one of the determinants of this kind of uh, product of uh, determinants over closed points is forced on you from the various properties. And then there's a complex normalization and a piezing normalization that I won't go into right now. But in fact, whenever the, that product converges, that should actually be the L function. So the complex normalization says, piezing normalization says that the piezing case, for motives anyways, should have an interpolation property in compatibility with the complex normalization. Okay. So those are the difficult Lewis functions that we, we don't understand, of course. But <coughs> in some sense, uh, the Hasse-Weil conjecture for complex sheaves and the main conjecture of the Iwasawa theory for piadic sheaves, you could view them as saying that this L invariant varies very nicely as a function of the sheaf. Right? So essentially, <coughs> you could formulate it as follows. 
if you consider any natural moduli space of sheets for a fixed x, x then M will carry a determinant line bundle that whose fiber over any point is the determinant of complex support determinant of homology of the sheaf corresponding to that point. And you could view these Hasseve type of conjectures as all proposing <coughs> that this line bundle has a canonical analytic section compatible with the conditions that we formulated before. And in some sense, uh, or a speculative reason for under trying to be interested in what physicists are doing is physicists seem to be very good at at least intuitively constructing sections of determinant of homology over moduli sheaves of this sort. Whereas in number theory, we still struggle to do this in in in, in, in well in every instance. Yeah. So I'll just keep that. Uh, you can formulate this in the usual terms, right? Just by considering twists of a single motivic shape, which is some kind of a one-dimensional <coughs> space. But <coughs> I think this picture is, the, is a good one to keep in mind, that the, uh, all these conjectures about analytic properties of L-functions, what it's actually saying is that this determinant line bundle has a nicely varying section over any natural motivic OK. So now finally, uh, let me describe <coughs> the trans Simon functional. Because um, somehow, I, <laughs> as we all agree, I think that L functions are global functions are moduli schemes of, uh, of sheaves. But they are very difficult to study. But the arithmetic trans Simon functions are very easy. And we'd like to somehow maybe investigate the relation between the two. So <coughs> I'll just remind you how it goes. I gave you already a specific case. So as before, we'll uh, 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 assume we're in this situation where the nth roots of unity have been trivialized. In that case, h1 of the scheme, I've already alluded to the fact with coefficients is n mod n or mu n, is canonically isomorphic with n mod n. So in fact, you can h take h3 of the group cohomology of the fundamental group of x and map it to the tau cohomology and get a function to that mod n. Now, this simple fact allows us to construct a function on Galois representation. That is to say, suppose you tell that A, B, and E finite group. So this is just a finite case. And the Piadi case uh, is quite similar, although slightly more technically complicated. And I'll allude briefly to the complication later. But anyways, given any finite group, you can consider a moduli space of representations of the, uh, the homomorphisms, namely, from pi 1 to A, modulo conjugation by A. And it's very easy to define the trans Simons function on those things using this arithmetic duality trivialization. How do you do it? Well, first we need to pick a cohomology class in H3. It is depend on this cohomology class. I forgot, it should have a subscript C here. And it has it on some slides, it doesn't have it on the slides. So using, but no, this is just a cohomology class of the finite group. This has nothing to do with, earth, uh, with uh, number theory. We're just taking a finite group cohomology class in H3. And in topology as well, people are used to this idea that the trans function depends on a group cohomology class. So you use that to define a function on, M uh, on the model space. Namely, it's very easy. You just, given any representation, you take this, co namely homomorphism from pi 1 to A, you pull back this cohomology class to an H3 class of pi 1, and then take the invariant, so you get a function. So that's, a, so that's the general trans Simons function with finite coefficients. Uh, so uh, our example is essentially what we did earlier. So if A happens to be the cyclic group Z mod N, then we can take uh, H3 class as being A cup product delta A, the, the box sign of A, where A is this little a is simply the identity regarded as a H1 class. Sorry, I mixed up mu n and z mod n. So it, in this context, it should just be z mod n. Sorry about that. And then um, take, this, uh, take uh, the Bolstein uh, map applied to that class coming from this exact sequence again. You get a H2 class if you take a cup product. That's the H3 class. That's the canonical generator of the H3 class. Uh, H3 of a, of a cyclic group. And then you can look at the trans Simons function associated to that. And that's actually the same as what I described earlier, using 
uh, the duality theory. But uh, <coughs> uh, people who did who've done uh, topological transignment theory will recognize this expression well, that, as we said, that already came up in the beginning as an exact analog of the top topological transignment. So that's an example. Uh, so let me make one trivial observation, which is really very trivial, but still interesting in this regard. Notice that if you take a representation and suppose it, uh, this homomorphism to Z mod n lifts to Z mod n square, right? then just by definition of the previous transignment invariant, then the transignment invariant will be zero. So there's a kind of curious, here at this point, trivial analogy between the kind of things you expect with L functions as well, the existence of certain extensions being correlated with the vanishing. Um, so uh, let me re also briefly describe the case of transignment functions for these arithmetic free manifolds with boundary, because you'll also need this to compute the transignments for this compact case. Namely, so if you have this case where you have S integers, remember I denote it by boundary of X as the, the, the union of the spec of the completions at the, at the places in S. Pi S is pi 1 of X S and pi B is R the lower groups. I think I already used this notation. And we'll also fix a collection of homomorphisms from pi B to pi S coming from a bunch of embeddings. We'll also assume that S contains all places dividing N. Now, <laughs> for this discussion, we need to fix actually a three co-cycle. It doesn't suffice just to fix a cohomology class, although it, it's uh, canonically independent of the representing class. You do need to fix a co-cycle for the discussion. So then, uh, how does this uh, transignment functional with boundaries go? Well, in addition to this global moduli space of homomorphism from pi s to a, you also have local moduli space consisting of these local homomorphisms from the local Galois group to a, modulo diagonal conjugation. And of course, there's a restriction map from one to the other. Any global representation can be restricted to a collection of local representations. <coughs> but the point is that now, pi sub s, remember, that's my notation for collections of local representation. Pi of s. But remember, if you're given any collection of local representations, and you use any one of them to pull back the co-cycle, the local field has no third cohomology. So this class in Z3 is trivial. So what you can do is you can look at the inverse image of this class inside the two co-chains modulo the two boundaries. Then you see that this is simply a torsor for H2, because the kernel of this thing is that the, the choice will be the, the well determined up to H2, which is exactly over a local field that Z mod n. <coughs> so if you take uh, uh, these choices over all V, then you get a torsor for the product of H2s over the places of S, that is product of Z mod n. And then you can just sum up that torsor, push that torsor out using the sum map, and get a, a, a single Z mod n torsor varying over the moduli space of local representations. So that's a, a analog of the transignment determinant line of the topology. Transignment line. On the other hand, if you have a class that actually, if you have an actual global representation, you can solve this equation globally because over the S integers, H3 is again zero. Once you have an open curve where S contains all the places dividing N, then H3 is again zero, so you can solve this equation globally as well. And then take the global solution and restrict it locally. And then you get uh, uh, an element of this torsor over the collection of local representations restricted from row. <laughs> but, but what's very easy to check is that actually this element is independent of the choice of the solution beta. And that's because of this reciprocity sequence. In fact, you get a canonical element that only depends on your scheme and, and your representation. It doesn't depend on the solution of this uh, co-boundary equation. Global, global co <coughs> so then as rho varies, you can view this as a canonical section 
of this torso of where the boundary module is based pulled back to the global module <coughs> by the restriction right? because you're associating an element of the line of the torso over the local model space for each global so you get a section of that space. Let me remark briefly in topological trans Simon theory, what does one do? One takes this kind of trans Simon lines, elements inside trans Simon lines, and run do an integral over all the rows that restrict to a specific boundary representation. That way you get a quantity that only depends on the boundary representation. And then as rho s varies, you get a section of, of, the, of the torso over the boundary model this page by integrating over all global representations that restrict to the same thing, one for every rho s, and then you let the rho s vary. Now this is this so-called quantization of this situation, or from the point of view of topological quantum field theory, this is the state in some, inside the boundary vector space that the theory assigns to the three-manifold XS. Uh, this, uh, uh, one can study analogs of this over a number of fields as well. <laughs> I haven't done it yet, uh, except for the trivial boundary case. But uh, I think an interesting question is what kind of roles one should be integrating over here. Anyways, we can discuss that later. For now, let me remark that um, when, uh, if you have a, a representation of the fundamental group of the compact all spec o, OX as a whole, <coughs> you can certainly lift it to a representation of the ramified Galois group. Right? So in other words, you get a lifting using this quotient map from the moduli space of representation of pi 1 of x to the moduli space of representation of pi 1 of xs. Okay. So over here, we just said that you get a trans Simon section inside the boundary torso space of xs. On the other hand, for every v inside s, here, this representation is uh, being assumed to be unramified everywhere. So for every V, there's also a representation of the unramified local Galois group induced by rho. So then, we can also solve this co-boundary equation over the unramified Galois group. Because for the unramified Galois group, H, H, H3 is trivial, but H2 is also trivial. So this solution is also independent of your choice in, in a certain sense. Okay, so you get, by summing up all these unramified trivialization, you get another element of the torso. And so we can take the difference between the global ramified trivialization and the local unramified trivialization. Uh, so theorem, this is actually, in a sense, it's a triviality, it's pure formalism, or just a way of computing compact support homology. It's actually, it says that the trans Simon invariant of rho can be computed by taking the global trivial is the section of the of the trans Simon line obtained from the global ramified trivialization and take subtracting the sum of the local unramified trivialization. So this is a precise analog of the decomposition from the trans Simon invariant that you see in topology. As I said, the key point is that this computation is simply the difference between two trivialization, a global ramified one and a local unramified one. You can use use this idea to compute it. So here's an example. I'll say this very quickly. So if P is congruent to 1 mod 4, you take that imaginary quadratic field Fp, depending on a t positive square free integer prime to P. Well, then if you join the square root of P to Ft, that ends up being an unramified exchanger. So that gives us a character of the fundamental group of OFT. So uh, uh, rather easy, uh, uh, well, not so easy, but elementary but difficult actually <laughs> computation to do. Is the the trans Simons invariant for this uh, trivial, uh, well, the, this canonical post cycle on the cyclic row uh, that we discussed earlier, evaluated at row 2. Rho t is one half, it's non trivial if and only if this genre symbol is minus one. So it was the reason for computing this is for a while I, I was worried that the trans Simons invariant was always trivial. But <laughs> anyway, it was nice to come up with collections of examples like this, and, and now we have other examples as well. But for example, so this is a, a trivial corollary. I'm sure there are other ways to see it, but it's just sort of illustrating the pro a certain perspective obtained from this theory is that if, as a corollary, if uh, the Legendre symbol of t at p is minus 1, 
then this thing here, this extension, doesn't, it will not embed inside an unramified set for extension. So that's a simple consequence of that computation. Okay. So there's a periodic version of this, which maybe I'll skip for now. We can discuss this uh, for people who are more interested in the afternoon. It works exactly the same in many senses. You get a ZP tracer over a local moduli space uh, in such a way that for global representation, you get an element of the Chern Simon line over the local re restriction of the global representation. But I will make this following remark. Uh, the key point of this is that what we get is that you can take, for example, a continuous Galois representation in GLN of ZP and then twist this with various powers of the psychotomic character and you get essentially continuous functions de defined on ZP star in a rather elementary and non-trivial way at least. Uh, I think the function is non-trivial at least, also the construction is elementary. And these kind of things are supposed to be rather difficult to do and that itself I think is a bit interesting aspect of the theory. Okay, so that's pretty much all I wanted to say. But maybe what I'll, I'll conclude then with a bit of extremely speculative motivation. So the remainder of this slide, this, uh, uh, the uh, remaining few slides are all complete nonsense, so you should tune it out if you get annoyed by this kind of nonsense. Well, I'll say it anyway, since uh, we're here at this uh, workshop to discuss. I'll say this nonsense anyway. So one, the motivation